find that so encouraging, but the battle's not over. This is a moment of both great achievement and great fragility. The farm antibiotic control that some nations have achieved covers only growth promoters, mostly doesn't cover that preventive dosing that Jukes also invented. At this point, there's only a handful of countries in the world that actually ban preventive use of antibiotics. Here in the United States, we continue to allow preventive use even when animals are not sick. Just about a year ago, the World Health Organization asked countries around the world to commit to taking preventive use of antibiotics out of their agriculture and to reserving the drugs only for use when livestock are sick. And a number of governments, including the Trump administration, said no. So, this is a problem that will not go away. We know that resistant bacteria move around the world. They move on meat, they move in our bodies, they move in the oceans and on the wind, and they're carried by seabirds. Foods are flown across the world to reach us. People travel and pick up bugs and bring them home. The temptation to place profit over public health is still with us as it was in the 1950s, when this long mistake of misusing antibiotics began. We have not yet fully reversed that historic mistake. I trust that we will, but we do not have much more time to get it right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stephen is on his way to me, but I probably, do we have time for people to ask questions? Okay, so it, Stephen in the back has a microphone, so if you would like to ask me a question, this is all being recorded, so it's important that you speak into the mic. Just put up your hand and someone will bring a mic to you. Keep your hands up so I can see how, hang on just a sec. There was someone up here, is anyone else? Just two, okay, please go ahead. Great, you got a, you got a great voice, by the way. Just to let you know, there was a recall on chicken uh, like yesterday, Tyson and uh, Purdue. You know anything about that? Uh, say the question again. A recall on chicken from Purdue and Tyson. I've been on the road since yesterday, so I haven't seen that news. So I don't know what the problem is. Sorry. I got you on that. Let me just ask you, what do you know about farm-raised salmon and the wild salmon from the Pacific Ocean? So the problem with farm-raised salmon is that, you know, intrinsically we're raising salmon in ways that they were not, that in conditions that they didn't evolve to experience, right? And that's the same thing with industrial scale confinement agriculture. One of the things that makes it possible for salmon to be held in that manner is the use of antibiotics. It shouldn't have to be that we use antibiotics, the very large Poultry producers who have moved away from antibiotics have found ways to keep their confinement animals healthy and therefore keep the price of their meat down without using antibiotics by using a number of other things. Now, there, there's the Atlantic salmon and the Pacific salmon, and I don't know if the conditions are different, but for sure in the Chilean salmon, which is in the Pacific, in warmer waters, they have a real problem with suppressing their antibiotic use. They're seeing a lot of fish diseases when they do in their confinement pens. Norway, with colder waters, has been able to cut antibiotic use. So the question is, what is it in the conditions in which the fish are being raised that requires the use of antibiotics? And are there things that can be substituted instead of antibiotics that will keep the selective pressure on bacteria from antibiotic use from happening? Um, the Burberry scarf up here, and then this lady here. Thank you, very eye-opening. Um, my question is, have you, with all of your research that you've done, come across any information about perhaps forward-thinking uh, farmers with the use of probiotics, uh, whether it be um, you know, preventative for any bacteria by uh, making the microbiome more effective in fighting them? But yeah, any, that's a anything? really great question. So um, I want to, to draw a distinction um, for the purpose of, of answering between smaller producers who raise in an organic or regenerative or pastured manner and the big industrial scale producers. Because 
animals that are in a pastured situation are naturally experiencing the microbiome of the place where they are, right? They're chomping on grass and insects and a whole variety of, um, of different species. And so they are sort of, um, w with having a natural diet, they are supporting their microbiome in a way that seems intuitive but isn't actually being measured. To turn to the industrial scale producers, when Purdue went antibiotic free and dragged the rest of the poultry industry with them, they confronted pretty quickly that if they were going to take antibiotics out of the diets of 30,000 chickens at a time raised in a barn with solid walls, they were going to have to do something else, some other supplementation to improve the, to support the immune systems of their birds in different ways. So they did a number of interesting things. The first thing they did was they, re they purified the birds' diets. It's not well known that a significant portion of the animals that we eat, when they're slaughtered, a certain portion of that animal is un in inedible, right? It's bones and collagen and skull and brain and things like that. In, in a chicken, it can be as much as 50% of the final weight of a chicken, if you include the feathers. All of that gets sold off into an industry called the rendering industry, which renders all of that down into protein and then sells it to the animal feed industry. So Purdue decided that they weren't going to use any more rendered products. They were going to give their birds a pure vegetarian-based diet. That was the first thing they did. The second thing they did was they started vaccinating their chicks a lot more so they'd be less vulnerable to disease and not need um, preventive antibiotics. Then they gave the birds um, opportunities to exercise in the barns, perches and things to jump down and flap off. They're, it's really very charming. And they cut windows in the barns so the birds could get sunlight on their feathers, which is an astonishing uh, innovation. It's against decades of, of practice in the, the industry. But they also started adding probiotics and prebiotics to the birds' diets. Um, and when you walk into one of their houses now, it kind of smells like a pizzeria because the things they add to the diets are things like thyme and oregano and yucca and cinnamon and other um, natural compounds that have a sort of natural sterilizing or antiseptic effect. And all of that together has allowed them to produce antibiotic-free meat at essentially the same price point as they were before. Um, so what, you know, I, exactly what their recipe is, I don't know. I'm sure they keep it um, proprietary. But that going in the direction of dietary supplementation as a way of supporting the immune system, which is a thing that pastured producers, animals do naturally, is really a big growth industry for the poultry and cattle and hog industries to pursue. Thanks for your question. Uh, over here. Um, would you please repeat what was exactly passed by the Obama administration and what was denied by the Trump administration? Sure. Thank you. So to remind, there are three uses of antibiotics in livestock, and you can think of them as on a spectrum. At one end, there is giving antibiotics to cure an infection that is obviously present, which is the same way we use antibiotics in people, right? At the other end of the spectrum, there's using antibiotics as growth promoters, which essentially perturbs the gut microbiome and causes animals to get more nutrition out of their feed and to put on tasty muscle mass faster. And then in the middle, there's this mushy category of preventive use in which they give antibiotics to animals to keep them from developing diseases. Giving antibiotics to animals to make them well is always legal and always has been. No one objects to that. It would be a violation of animal welfare not to treat a sick animal. What the Obama administration did was to make functionally illegal um, they didn't do it by means of a law, but instead by means of what's called a guidance within the FDA, the other end of the spectrum, that using tiny doses as growth promoters to increase the deposition of muscle on a carcass. What they did not do, and what very few nations have done, is to tackle that mushy middle of using antibiotics preventively, which is still a use that should not occur, 
because it's not using antibiotics to treat, to prevent, sorry, it's not using antibiotics to treat an infection that's present. It's using antibiotics to prevent an infection from occurring across the entire flock or herd. After the 2016 election, I think it was in about the end of 2017, the World Health Organization said to all its gov the governments that belong to it, we think it's time to tackle this issue of preventive use. We would like to see your governments move toward banning preventive use of antibiotics as well as growth promotion. And the Trump administration said, no, we're not going to do that. And th this should not be a surprise, right? This is a pro-business administration. Any regulation that, um, that curbs the ability of businesses to follow their usual business practices is not a thing that this administration is going to be in favor of. So the, the, the arc of improvement in agricultural use of antibiotics has essentially stopped. And whether it will continue or not pretty much depends on what the political situation will be over the next two or four or 10 years. Is that more clear? Great, thank you. Um, I think we need the, okay, do, we need the mic back. Um, are there groups of people or organizations that have actually tied what has been learned about the effects of the preventive vaccinations of animals to what happens with people with all the preventive vaccinations that we're receiving now and that are in some states for people? I think what you're asking are, are there people objecting to vaccination of animals? No. Um, not to my knowledge, anyway, because um, they're not the same vaccines, right? So we don't, we don't the, the, um, the vaccines about which people are hesitant for children, which are, you know, things like measles and, and rubella and mumps and whooping cough and so forth, those are not the vaccines that are given to animals. The vaccines that are given to animals are against things like salmonella and E. coli and Marek's disease. Um, so they're very different. So they're not tying it in in any way. They're not making any kind of... Uh, I am not aware of any advocacy against animal vaccination. I hope it doesn't happen because no, no. It's, the, it's the use of vaccines that is, key, that is preventing us from having to use antibiotics as much as we did. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Probably have time for, oh, there's one all the way in the back. Yeah. Hi. I don't know if it's appropriate question here, but maybe you have information. Uh, it was a lot of information in the media, and right now, chicken killed here, transport to China for cheap labor packaging, and get back to states. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell something about it? If you know, if it's true or not, how they do it? Um, so yeah, that's true. It is true that that happens. It's true that it's it's been proposed. And you know, one of the things that we don't um, really think about much, probably because the information is not made easily available to us, is how much uh, food that we eat that is processed in some manner moves around the world in its processing. Um, I sat next to someone on a, a plane once who described how uh, fish. Lar big, large fish, the fish that get that are you know the, the size of like this podium that get get caught and uh, butchered, essentially cut up into smaller pieces and then breaded and then frozen and then boxed and then end up in the cold case in your supermarket. That those actually travel around the world in the process of being cut up and breaded and returned to us. That they're not all, that's, that doesn't happen like within a couple of miles of wherever the boat lands that has the fish on it. Um, and it's, this happens with a lot of our food, that things move around the world because it's so inexpensive to transport things that, and labor is so cheap in the developing world that putting a fish on a boat and sending it to I will pull a name out of the air, Thailand, and processing it there and shipping it back, all of that process together is less expensive than actually processing the fish and packaging it and, and transporting it just here in the United States. 
And that as that's true, fish is, I'm giving you an example because someone happened to describe that to me, but it's absolutely the case for chicken as well. That's where that, that permission is coming from to transport chicken to China and process it and then bring it back. Our defense against um, something bad happening with this is, uh, you know, we have federal agencies that are supposed to detect when there are problems arising in food that are coming into the country. That's primarily the FDA under a, a law called the Food Safety Modernization Act that is now not quite a decade old, I think. But um, the FDA at the moment is very underfunded, and there's nowhere near enough inspection either in the United States or at the points of origin um, on the other side of the, trans the line of transport to absolutely make sure that we are safe from any contamination happening out of our site. Thanks for your question. I think we have time for one more. Does it, are there any more questions in the room? I am not, nope, yes? Okay, this will be the last question. Uh, you said that everybody has this bad bacteria in their body and your immune system basically can fight it. What about if there is an outbreak? There are people who survive even with this bacteria resistant. Uh, what, what's the secret? I mean, somehow you said about the chicken, you have to have a good diet, exercise, sunshine, what else? I don't think I understand your question. Try me again. What makes some people more uh, resistant to bad bacteria than others, mm. even without antibiotics? Just kind of the magic of our immune system. Um, that, you know, you, you probably experience that, you know, in a, in a class or in a daycare center or in an office, if someone brings in uh, a virus, a cold, something like that, some people seem to be naturally more vulnerable than others. And that's true as well for, for any kind of infection. Um, there are things we can all do to support our immune systems, to make them generally more resilient and less vulnerable to infection. But in the end, it's sort of, it, it's, it's what medicine would call a host factor. It's all down to the individuality of us. And also for us, there is this uh, preventing antibiotic because I just had some dental work done and the, the dentist gave me uh, amoxicillin. So there are, that's true. There are some rare cases in which preventive antibiotics are used in people um, to, pre to prevent infection. If, for instance, you have a heart murmur and you're going to have dental work done that might dislodge bacteria from your teeth that then might go into your bloodstream. Sometimes they're given in advance of um, prostate biopsies or given in advance of particular surgeries, but that's always on an individual basis. The thing that makes preventive antibiotic use so hazardous for agriculture is it's being given to hundreds and thousands and millions of animals at a time, that's a lot of antibiotic to put into the ecosystem to potentially encourage the, the adaptation, the evolution of bacteria toward resistance and away from vulnerability to antibiotics. When you're giving antibiotics to a single person at a time, the risk is much, much less. The benefit is increased. The risk is diminished. I think I have to stop here. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>